welcome back to the Garage Gym PT Podcast. Uh, sitting with you again is Lou and Dave. Yeah, good to be here. So we hope you guys enjoyed the conclusion of the strength and conditioning principles series that we kind of followed up through. I think like the first seven episodes were all about the principles. Um, what Dave and I are going to kind of dive into today is we're just going to talk about um, you know, we, well, first of all, kind of backtracking, we talked about honoring the soft tissue um, healing times. Well, what Dave and I are going to kind of hash out a little bit today is recovery methods. So this could be after a workout, you know, giving yourself adequate time before hitting the same muscle group again. This could be even post-surgical, you know, um, maybe, maybe just some little, as Dave's called it before, some low-hanging fruits. Um, to just kind of make you guys aware of so that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Well, we're going to help bring this to light for you guys. Um, yeah. Uh, to touch on it a little bit more, it's a window for a reason guys. So, you know, if you say six to eight weeks, we're trying to get you towards the six week mark in away from the eight to 12 week mark. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is all held in a vacuum and it's, it's, if things go, appropriately uh but why would two twins have different results when you kind of compare them a to b right so mm -hmm. with all this stuff you know maybe you take one twin they're doing everything right and then you take the other twin and they're doing everything wrong you know here are some things that you can take from the twin that's doing it right and get towards the beginning of that time frame and not towards the end and this is got a ton of like little nuggets and stuff that like I love. And this is the conversation that I, I really like to have with my people. I agree. I do the same thing, especially my post-surgical patients who, um, uh, I mean, what's the first thing when people are no longer allowed to be in the gym, uh, no longer allowed to exercise because they have to kind of wait, rest, recover. Um, a lot of them are terrified that they're either going to get so out of shape or they're going to put on so much weight. And one of the things that I've, I've had to have more discussions over the last five years than I ever anticipated in the field is, is when my patients are telling me how little they're eating. Uh, that's usually where I've had to find um, really some registered dietitians in the area just to kind of bring to light the importance of nutrition after rehab. Um, just because it's, most most people want to start cutting out so many calories because their activity level is so low now. But what they don't understand is that that tissue needs those building blocks in order to, you know, basically build it back up, repair, heal, remodel, um, just to kind of get back to doing everyday things. But when they start like basically starving themselves, um, you're working against yourself. You're, yeah. you're not helping. There's a, there's a really cool study and I, I think i've like heard it off of lane norton uh don't don't quote me exactly on this but basically it states that the more active you are the more you're likely to under eat and the less active you are the more likely you are to have been in the category of overeating mm -hmm. so the more you do typically the less you want to eat because i don't know there's some relationship between like satiety and activity so that person yeah. that's on your table, especially if they're an athlete, are most likely in the underfed category before they're ever going to be considered in the overfed category, which is something to consider, like, period. So, I don't know, the, the, the most basic question that I try to ask people here is, you know, are you hitting a daily recommended allowance of protein? And then we're trying to get them conscious that they are likely, I've seen half of what they likely need to be yeah. so i mean even extrapolating this forward to make it more specific the, the bare minimum for somebody who's doing activity at a high level in exercising you know anywhere upward of three to seven days a week is probably in the one gram of protein per pound of body weight category and likely slightly above it yeah so if this is not something that you are considering for yourself, please dive into my fitness pal, do something. And if you weigh 200 pounds and you're around 120 to 100 grams of protein a day, this could be the thing that's holding you back, period. 
yeah progressions right. looking at all that's important yeah um so like from a basic nutritional standpoint like that's the first thing that i'm hitting on with people maybe the second thing is hydration from this standpoint your minimum thresholds probably start at half of your body weight in ounces of water so if you're at 200 pounds 100 ounces of water is the bare minimum and anything under that you're likely lacking some physiological processes mm -hmm. so one of the things that i've had to have a lot of discussions especially with my younger athletes um it's just with how much they're going to practice, how much they're training over at no name. Uh, and then really how much they do outside of those two things as well. You know, what, whatever they do with their friends um, active wise. Um, if they're so as soon as you said, like the nutrition aspect of it all, I immediately thought of one patient in particular who, when I asked her, you know, what do you, what do you typically eat in a day? And she recorded it and she, gummy worms for breakfast i was like like this is a joke right like you're messing with me she's like no i was like okay okay so we had to have a discussion on that um no i i've even seen uh with uh the grams of protein a pound when you said a, a gram per pound i've even seen that as high as um a gram and a half per pound of body weight um with some of the more intense uh, athletes that I've had before. Um, hydration, I agree with that on the hydration one side of things. Um, I think sometimes what people also don't take into consideration with the hydration though, is sometimes like electrolytes. Um, and like the, just the, the natural salts that you sweat out, you have to replenish those just as much. Um, you know, yeah. our, our <clears throat> in terms of like our, I mean, I won't get too in depth in this, but like your body requires a lot of those salts in order to sustain and maintain contractions. Um, if you don't have those, you know, your calciums, your sodiums, uh, your potassiums, those wonderful chemicals in your body, you're not supplying that. You're not going to be able to optimize your performance. Yeah. A quick check on this is <laughs> if you're a person who eats quote unquote clean, meaning a ton of non-processed things and you have a high propensity for cramps, you most likely have a terrible electrolyte balance. And it's just one yeah. of those things that I'd like to ask people too. They're like, oh, I always feel like I'm cramping. I'm not really getting good muscular contraction. Or even at like a basic level, if, if you can't feel things appropriately and there's no quote unquote pump scenario, I'm clearly looking at sodium as something that you're lacking, at least anecdotally. <laughs> And yeah. something that should be said here is like, this is outside of the person that already has like high blood pressure and all of that. So if you are a 18 to 45 year old person and you have very good function, then go for it. But if you have high blood pressure, cardiac issues, please consult somebody that would be able to inform you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a big thing as well. I mean, I, I love getting the um, the registered dietitian involved especially with a lot of the athletes that we've, I've had the pleasure of working with over the years like if you can get a registered dietitian on board that actually understand and like we actually talked about this with Matt Frakes from LSU getting someone who understands the demand of sport and how you need to fuel for performance um, that is that is a game changer that yeah. is huge and a lot of like the basic numbers when you talk about that from a regular person skew vastly upwards mm -hmm. so then that caloric gap or the protein gap or the hydration gap actually gets larger and larger as you start to add in more layers to your training it's actually kind of cool when you start getting into it all because it's like you think when you're working out and you're trying to lose weight you know you have to I mean, I've seen huge cuts in calories from people sometimes when it's like, oh man, you're because the the exercise intensity is constantly going up, but then they're cutting at such a drastic level. It's like some of it's just it it needs to be monitored. And I don't yeah. think on a on an individual basis someone can do that effectively. So that's why don't be afraid to get an extra helping hand in there. Yeah. And 
and if, and if you do this for too long, you're actually screwing up your hormones. Mm -hmm. So at some rate, like it is best to kind of track it on a loose scenario. Um, like I said, I don't want to dive too much into the weeds on that, but you're missing opportunities to put on muscle mass, recover, um, create better habits at, mm -hmm. at a bare minimum. And at worst, you're screwing up some pretty key processes in your body that can have long-term consequences. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's dive a little bit more, Dave, into um, someone who's consistently like overstimulating the system. So they're just break down, break down, break down, um, not necessarily giving themselves the chance to recover. Uh, let's kind of go through some of the, the breakdown of the tissue and like, like, let's just put some names to it. So, right, like tendinitis, tendinosis, tenosynovitis, right? Um, when you have that constant breakdown and you're not allowing that tissue to heal itself, or you have that quick overload, that quick, like you, you didn't do a good job of monitoring your progressions, right? And so now you go to that acute inflammatory aspect of it all that where, where the tissue just is pissed off in a short term. Um, without having the ability to monitor that nutrition aspect of it all, that's also an area where you're going to work against yourself. Um, so with say, let's say tendonitis patient, Dave, how would you and I be able to go about instructing that person on what they need to do in order to start the healing properties or heal the healing phase, I guess. Uh, from, from a physiological perspective, uh, I, I advise people to do a couple things there. One would be to stay away from ice to maximize the amount of blood flow. The second is actually a way that you would want to stir up inflammation to start or cascade the healing response, i.e. scraping, dry needling, um, even like pecking with a dry needle mm -hmm. directly at the side of the tendonitis. And then all of these things are all signals to get blood flow to the area. What does blood carry? It carries all the building blocks necessary to actually build the tissues back up. So this is where it's in the patient's hands to actually put good things into their body so that you're laying down the appropriate amount of bricks to rebuild your house rather than continuing to, you know, take away from the foundation and get weaker and weaker and weaker. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who maybe don't understand the difference between like, you know, your tendonitis, your, your tendinosis, uh, think of tendonitis as like a quick progression in loading to, or like repetition in a particular movement at a particular load where your body's just not ready for that. So there's a quick breakdown, a quick irritation leading to basically like pain, swelling, uh, difficulty with sustaining contraction or painful with contraction, uh, which that, that, I mean, it can set you back a little bit, but in all honesty, if you can start getting into the healing response and getting things to start moving again, um, you can get things to calm down pretty quick. I mean, obviously you have, like we've said before, honor those healing times with the tissues, but with the tendinosis, think of this as like a, like a chronic breakdown where like the tendon has now tried to heal, but you haven't really monitored or adjusted based off the symptoms as well as you maybe could have. So then that healing response is going to be blunted or stunted to the point where like you're not allowing the tissue to build itself back up. So it's a constant breakdown where there's a little bit of buildup, break back down more, a little bit of buildup, break down more, a little bit of buildup, break down more. And it's so, used to like a constant neglect from the user side as well. Yes. So it's something that they think will go away. And rather than addressing it, they kick the can down the road two, three, four times. And then essentially you're left with like if you can picture um, like a rubber band stretching, if you continue mm -hmm. to stretch the rubber band, eventually the fibers actually break down and it gets weaker. So this is what's happening at the tendinous level to make it as simple as possible. Then it loses its elasticity. And then obviously you get pain and you have to build the fibers of the rubber band back up. Yep that constant degeneration. 
Uh, and obviously, if this continues to go unmonitored or just neglected, uh, that can eventually lead to rupture, um, which is not fun for anybody. <laughs> so don't do it. Uh, now, kind of going more into like the tenosynovitis, um, when you kind of go along the outskirts in the tendon area, there's actually like, think of it as like a scabbard of a sword, right? There's like a sheath around the tendon that can also become inflamed. Um, that one can be a little bit more tricky sometimes, but I honestly haven't had a whole lot of patients dealing with tenosynovitis, um, more so in the Achilles region and sometimes even in like the biceps tendon or the lat, but honestly, nothing that's been too insane or crazy with that. Um, and even like categorically, it still kind of fits diagnostic wise towards tendonitis, at least for the stuff that I've seen. Yeah. Um. Uh, so kind of kind of building off of that, let's go with someone when you have just, let's say you've just done back squats. What are you doing when you work out, right? You're creating those little pairs within the musculature, which is going to create soreness. It's going to create irritation in the muscle, right? Uh, how sore you are could be a result of how much of the micro tears you've created within the musculature. Um, so stimulus, right? Back squats. You've created micro tears. You've created irritation. So now let's move on to the, that 48 hours later, right? What do you feel like when going down the steps? You might feel like crap, right? You might feel like every single step is a chore. Uh, so when you have that and you're going through that section of healing, your body is still in the process of rebuilding those micro tears or rebuilding the musculature within where those micro tears were at. Um, not necessarily a fun process, but it's necessary for growth, right? So what can you do in the meantime to help facilitate that the late onset muscle soreness or that, that DOMS, Dave, right? Um, what have you kind of instructed patients to do when they have this, this like maybe excessive soreness or maybe even just a little bit more aching than usual? Sure. Um, I'm very much one for less cardio. So at the end of the day, you are, you're trying to get as many episodes of blood flow as possible to this area, mm -hmm. right? So instructing people to take 10 minute walks multiple times a day, taking a period where you're doing like a 35 minute bike flush where you're not getting your cardiovascular system too worked out. So first piece is easy cardio. Second piece is going to be work opposing muscle groups. So if you are doing lowers, the next day do uppers. So yeah. when using that, that, I guess that template to kind of go into that, um, let's say you have a new goer, a new, new gym goer. Um, how have you like led them down the path of, or like maybe patient, led them down the path of kind of mitigating that, that soreness after exercise, or like maybe even a patient, like when they, they first start exercising at, in their sessions with you, um, how have you gone about kind of teaching them? Like you're going to feel worse because I'm making you use muscles that you necessarily maybe don't use that often. Uh, it does kind of come down to individual to individual, right? So soreness is not necessarily indicative of a good or bad workout. Mm -hmm. uh, but it definitely does tell you that you need to wait a little bit longer. Um, so if I'm trying not to make somebody super sore, I'm going to watch total volume. And I'm actually going to watch the uh, type of exercise that I try to do. Mm -hmm. Meaning that like you can do certain exercises um, that typically don't make people sore or types. So if you would like want to make somebody super sore and have DOMS, the thing that you would likely want to do is stick them into as heavy and eccentric or time under tension type of movement as possible. <laughs> so doing, I don't know, say like a Bulgarian split squat, just because you, that is one thing that always makes people sore. 
where you are making them stick in the mid-range of motion, going up and down in a three count, or maybe sets of eights to 12, you know, heavy as loaded possible. And then load them up with like five sets or something like. So in this instance, why don't we just bump it down to three sets or four sets, do six to eight reps, and then just let them control the pace and the load. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's, so let's go into a few different like types of exercises and what maybe provides like, so think about like baseball players, right? Where they have so many games in a week. Like I have a baseball player right now who he's got, I think five games in like three days. And I'm like, holy crap, like two double headers in one single game. I was like, okay. Um, so we've had to talk about like a lot of different things in regards to um, just sustaining control over his soreness, because that's a lot of throwing. I mean, he's, he's a pitcher in two of the games, I think. And he's just going to be under a ton of load, a ton of like just throwing. Um, so we had to talk about like things he can do in between kind of like active recovery in between games that we've been kind of working on with him. Um, but let's, let's kind of dive into some of the different, maybe like, like powerlifting and CrossFit. Uh, Cause obviously CrossFit's got high intensity Metcons that are quite frequent, right. Depending on the coach and the gym um, and then powerlifting, depending on what type of programming you're following, but we could, we could kind of go into the conjugate style a little bit more. Um, with how they kind of maybe monitor and change with the the max efforts as well as the dynamics. Um, which one would you like to take off with? Uh, kind of think it's easier to do from a logistical setup. This okay. CrossFit varies so greatly from gym to gym. That yeah, that's very true. Um, so yeah, and they actually don't really have any quote unquote global template unless you go to CrossFit.com. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, kind of, it's very easy to explain at least from my experience. So typical template, they do six days, by the way, guys. So this is assuming all of your other stuff is on point. So typically they'll do where I go. It'll be a max effort lower into a dynamic effort upper. I think in traditional conjugate systems, this is where you would stick in a special exercise day, but they do weightlifting at my gym. Then you move into a dynamic lower on Thursday, mm -hmm. a max effort upper on Friday. And I think that there is also another uh, special exercise or hypertrophy-based day uh, at the end of this block. Saturday is usually another kind of special exercise or weightlifting day. Okay. Okay. In the, uh, sorry, the um, powerlifting model, your Wednesday and Saturdays would not be weightlifting. They would be special exercises just for clarification here. Yeah. So when you have that, that max effort, you're giving yourself how much in between the max effort and then the dynamic effort, right? Um, so that's actually one of the reasons why I've kind of gravitated toward, towards the, uh, the conjugate style of programming is because you can hit different variations of stimulus, both with like heavy loading, but then also with like speed, right. Or modifying the sticking points with the bands and the chains, um, which has just been, it's honestly, it's been refreshing to kind of have a whole new game plan and stimulus of change for me. Um, I think that's why I love it so much because I've been seeing so much. I mean, you're going to see a lot of progress with that. But one of the things that, like recover, like like Dave, you already said, like being on point with this is is having your nutrition, having your sleep, having your hydration, all those things on point because that type of a program, it's meant to build you up if you have those all on point. But it can be come back at you real quick if you're not maintaining all of that because it is such a high stimulus type of training program, right? And this is going to be kind of an unpopular opinion, but a lot of people that do go into that program that have success with it chronically, 
are probably enhanced. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, none of the federations test for it. It just is what it is. But being a natural athlete in doing something like that, you really have to be on point. Yeah. Yeah. So with, when you have such a high training stimulus, maintaining and monitoring, this is why we, we talked about all these principles in the beginning, is when you want to maintain and monitor the volume, the intensity, um, and then the frequency of how much you're training, like all of those things kind of play into how well and how you need to plan your recovery. Everyone can have a big training game, right? You can have as many sets, reps, um, and sessions as you want, but if you're not good at the recovery game, that's where things can kind of go backwards on you. So it's like, when you look at how all of that has to plan out with, with that, um, it doesn't matter if you're using dry needling. It doesn't matter if you're using the cold tubs. It doesn't matter if you're using an infrared sauna. It doesn't matter what you're using modality wise. If you don't understand how healing rates work, you don't understand how recovery needs to work and you just keep beating yourself up, up, up. You will constantly go backwards instead of going forwards. And I think yeah. that needs to be said. You just keep stripping bases off the pyramid. So from like a physiological perspective, if you ever have any expectation of making progress, you know, there might be three or four buckets, right? So one's nutrition, two's hydration, three is sleep, and then four might be anything else that you would add on to it, like that steady state cardio. Um or, I don't know, stretching, yoga, anything you would throw into this bucket. But four is ineffective if you don't have the top three. Bingo. Bingo. And that's why I think what, what Dave and I are probably going to start doing, like now that we've kind of talked a little bit about recovery, um, we might start going into some common, you know, uh, irritations with lifting. So, like, for example pressing into the overhead or maybe lower back pain with deadlifting. Like we'll go through modifications, but also kind of talk about, you know, structurally what could be coming irritated um, and then kind of building off of those things. But if you guys have specific examples, please send them to us. Um, and then we can maybe talk through some of them. Um, but let's see here. Was there anything else you wanted to hit on Dave with the recovery aspect? No, not too much. I mean, once again, just to piggyback off the big messages, recovery is in your guys' hands, right? Like we're viewed as recovery experts, but we see you two hours a week and you have 99% of the week to go take advantage of these things. So mm -hmm. if you're not doing it and you're wondering why progress is stalling, please go back to these very basic principles. All right, so am I obeying these four methods of recovery? Obey those laws and you'll be in a better spot. Very nice. So we hope you guys enjoyed today's discussion. Dave and I will see you guys in the next episode. Talk to you soon.